Aren't we always going to sin in thought, word, and deed so long as we're in this human flesh? Can we really live holy in this life? I mean, after all, I'm human. I'm going to fail sometime. Good morning and welcome to God's Resistance. Thank you for tuning into God's Resistance, where we resist sin, self, the devil, and the world. You can hear us every Sunday at 9 a.m. on WITK, 1550 a.m. and 94.7 FM. We are local. We're in the Wyoming Valley, the Wilkesbury area. And as I've said so many times and every time, we are looking to start small groups. We want to talk about spiritual matters and look at the Bible together. Why? Because we want objective truth. We want to know what the truth is. And we are trying to be disciples ourselves, but we also want to make disciples as Jesus told us to. So you can find us on Facebook and Twitter at God's Resistance. That is G-O-D-S-R-E-S-I-S-T-A-N-C-E. Make sure to like and follow us for video content, teaching and preaching. You can find us on YouTube as well. Be sure to subscribe and turn on the bell to be notified of any new videos. Please also look for the God's Resistance podcast on your favorite podcast platform. If you'd like to have a Bible study or you want to pray with somebody or talk to somebody, then please contact us at gods.resistance at gmail.com or give us a call at 570-362-7782. Now let's listen in on today's briefing. Last time I was talking about after one is sanctified holy, they've had their heart purified by faith. Does that mean that growth stops? Have we reached the pinnacle of the Christian experience? And we went through a bunch of different scriptures showing how there is still room for growth and even yet more growth unhindered because that problem in the heart is taken care of. So I want to also at this point help us to understand another truth of holiness and humanity dwelling together. There is nothing, they're, they're not against one another. God's taken this into his calculation. And I'd like to look in 2 Corinthians 4 7 to start this off. It says, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. That begs a question. What is the treasure? The treasure here is the indwelling Christ through the Holy Ghost. And we are, you could say, what are the earthen vessels? We're the earthen vessels. Our human bodies, including our physical, mental, and spiritual being. So we have the treasure of the indwelling Christ in our human bodies so that Christ's strength may be seen in our weaknesses. Let's ask another question then. Is this weakness sin? What kind of life does God call us to live according to these verses? A lot of people get sin and human weakness mixed together, and that'll make it be so that we're so confused about God and his dealings with mankind. So we have this treasure in earthen vessels. There is a weakness that we can recognize. What kind of life does God call us to live according to these verses? Let's look in 1 John 2.1. He is telling these people that he calls beloved, which are Christian people, my little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. In other words, he was teaching them truth and doctrine for the purpose that the Christian should not sin. That is what, that's the way a Christian should live without sin, that ye sin not. And notice he said, and if any man sin, he didn't say when he's not expecting us to sin. He's saying, if it happens though, don't be throw everything overboard and get so discouraged. You have an advocate with the father. So the Christian life is a life without sin. That is what this scripture is teaching. In 1 Corinthians 15, 34, we read, Awake to righteousness and sin not. It doesn't say in sin less. It says sin not. For some have not the knowledge of God, and I speak this to your shame. So this weakness that we're told in this verse here about us being earthen vessels is not sin. 
but rather infirmities and physical limitations, maybe even mental limitations. So what is sin versus an infirmity, a weakness? In Romans 6.23, we read, For the wages of sin is death. So what's the result of sin according to this verse? Death, right? So is sin a moral issue? Yes, it is. Sin is a moral issue then, which leads to eternal death. Here's another place in the same book of Romans, but in the eighth chapter in the 26th verse, we read, likewise, the spirit of God, the spirit also helpeth our infirmities. So what is an infirmity? An infirmity is a physical, mental, or spiritual issue that does not have a moral quality. It is a weakness somehow in us, in our disposition, that does not have that right or wrong necessarily attached to it so far as I've transgressed against God and my motive has been to sin against him. That's not there. It's an involuntary weakness that we have. But what does the Spirit do with our infirmities according to this verse? The Spirit helps our infirmities. Notice the vast difference here. The Spirit helps our infirmities, but He condemns our sins. He convicts us of sin. He shows us that it's wrong, and we're condemned for our sins. So Romans 6.23 says, the wages of sin is death. Romans 8.26 says, the Spirit helpeth our infirmities. Those two things can exist at the same time in a holy heart, and we need to understand that so we can walk intelligently before our God. So is there inconsistency then between humanity and holiness. Can humans be holy while they're living in this human flesh? Human nature is not like Adam and Eve before the fall. Even somebody who's been saved, even somebody who's been sanctified holy and filled with the Holy Ghost, they're not like Adam and Eve were before the fall, nor are they like angels with absolute perfection. But there is a Christian perfection that they can have. I'd like to take this time to compare human, natural humanness, and that which is evil or wrong. So let's look at Ecclesiastes 9.10. Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. For there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave whither thou goest. I want to talk for a moment about pride. Here we find a sense of pride in this verse. And what I mean by that is a sense of self, self-worth, a sense of doing good work and knowing that you do good work. He tells us, whatever our hand finds to do, do it with all our might. Put our whole passion into it. Put our whole strength into it. Do a good job. Don't do a sloppy job, is what we're told. Compare that, however, to Naaman. Naaman was a man who was leprous, and he was told to go to the prophet of God in Israel. And Naaman had a pride that barred him from washing in the muddy Jordan. And Uzziah, that was emboldened by his pride, to burn incense on the altar, which only the right uh, the, the right of the priests could do. So here we find two separate men. Naaman didn't, because of his pride, want to go down to this muddy river to wash, and his servant reasoned with him and said, hey, if it was some big, mighty deed, wouldn't you go forth and do it? And he said, yeah, I would do that. And he realized that out of the pride of his heart, he didn't want to do that simple feat. But when he humbled himself, Look what happened. Naaman was healed. Then we look at Uzziah, and he was emboldened by his pride, thinking that he could do the job and go up to the altar and burn incense, but it was only the priests that were allowed to burn this incense. Let's look at another issue. Anger. Is anger consistent with a holy life? We read in Mark 3, 5, Jesus looked round about them, or round about on the Pharisees with anger because of the hardness of their hearts. Here we find a holy indignation against wrong and sin, but not carnal towards people themselves. So 
as a parent, you can have anger towards a child's disobedience, or you can have anger towards injustice witnessed. You can have that anger, and it doesn't have to be that anger which God condemns. It can actually be a good, right, and holy anger. It could also be mixed with a carnal and a wrong anger, but it is possible to have an anger there that is righteous in the sight of God. However, compare that kind of an anger with what we see in Balaam towards his donkey. He's riding along on his donkey, and his donkey bows down a couple times, crushes his foot against the wall because the donkey sees the angel of the Lord in front of him. And Balaam gets so mad, he wants to kill the donkey, just cut its head off and slay it. He gets so angry towards the donkey. Or what about Saul towards David? When David starts to get elevated in the eyes of the people, Saul gets jealous. And then what happens with Saul's jealousy? Well, Saul, getting jealous, is then uh, has an anger in his heart that is wrong towards God. And David and Jonathan are such close friends. And his son then says, Jonathan says, I, you know, David, you're the king. God chose you. And his father was so angry toward him, he wanted to throw a javelin at him and to kill him. Well, we find a difference between a righteous indignation and an unrighteous indignation right here. What about jealousy? Paul was jealous with a godly jealousy over the Corinthians. We read that in 2 Corinthians 11, 2. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin, virgin to Christ. So he had a holy guard over those that he loved. And you and I, we need to have a holy guard over the people we love. If you're a husband, you need to have a holy guard over your wife. You don't want her being around with other men. There is a reasonable jealousy that we should have to guard and protect our wife, to guard and protect our children, our family. It's the same with a pastor, to guard and protect those people whom he's pastoring. He has a holy jealousy over them, and God expects us to have that. However, compare that with a with that right jealousy with a carnal jealousy. Let's look at Haman's jealousy against Mordecai. He was moved to hatred because Mordecai would not bow down to Haman. He made a giant gallows to hang Mordecai on because he was jealous. He was jealous that Mordecai was was starting to, uh, well, that he wouldn't bow down to him. And then he starts to get the accolades of the king and things don't go so well. And then he ends up getting hung on the gallows himself. What about Ahab's jealousy over Naboth's field? He cries like a little baby when he can't get the field. And he tells his wife, and then his wife goes does a heinous crime and kills Naboth and says, there, the field's yours now. What a terrible thing. There you see two different kinds of jealousy, one that is right and one that's not right. Desires in and of themselves. Let's think about the sexual desire. Within marriage, that sexual desire is good, right, and holy. And that sexual desire in and of itself isn't even evil. It's what we do with it. We're told in 1 Corinthians 7, 5 that we're, as a husband and a wife, you're not to defraud one another. In other words, God encourages that intimate relation between a husband and a wife. However, compare that with David's lust for Bathsheba. When David was on the rooftop and he looked down and saw Bathsheba bathing herself, he lusted after her, and then that led him to call for her and commit adultery with that lady. He sinned against God there. That, that sexual desire was fulfilled in an evil manner there in David. What about the desire for food? We're told in 1 Timothy 6.17 that God has given us all good things to enjoy. We're also told in Colossians 2, 21 through 23, uh, touch not, taste not, and that that doesn't do anything to get rid of the evil inside of our heart. Uh, getting rid of it, some, you know, just trying to harm ourselves. Oh, I'm just going to eat, um, you know, food that's terrible because I want to punish myself because my human flesh is evil. He said, no, no, no. We're to enjoy the good things of God that he gives to us. However, well, and then, and then let's think about that in Acts 2.46. We read that they, the apostles, continuing daily want, with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. So here we find they were eating food and they had it with gladness and singleness of heart and fellowship one with another. Compare that to the warning that we find in Proverbs 23, 21. For the drunkard and the glutton shall come to poverty and drowsiness shall clothe a man with rags. So the desire for food can be overindulged to the point where it becomes sin. Corinthians, we find Paul rebuking them. They had a desire for food around the communion table, and they started scoffing all of this while they're having their love feast, and they left the poor with no food. And he said, if you're hungry, 
eat food at home, but when you come together, this is for the Lord's table. This is for communion together. Everyone should be able to partake. So we find that even that simple desire of food can be fulfilled in a manner that is at odds with God and is a sin in his sight. Think about the desire for appreciation. It's natural to want people to like you, but it we should never allow that to make us compromise truth. Jesus, where we see a picture of him in Psalm 69, 20, reproach hath broken mine heart, and I'm full of heaviness, and I look for some to take pity, but there was none, and for comforters, but I found none. He looked for people to have pity. We see it's natural that he wanted to be appreciated. He wanted to be loved. He wanted to have people surrounding him that would support him and help him, but he didn't find any people. Notice, though, that he didn't turn his back on the cross because he didn't have companionship. He went the lonely road in spite of it. What about love of self? People sometimes say, well, you shouldn't love yourself because that's evil and a sin against God. Not so. Look at Mark 12, 31. We're told to love our neighbors as ourselves. So there is a self-love that is right in the sight of God. We need to keep it in check because it can't, it can't go over and above what it's supposed to be. You know, we love ourselves when we have a fear of pain or danger. 2 Corinthians 7, 5, we read, For when we were coming to Macedonia, that's Paul and his companions, our flesh had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. Without were fightings, and within were fears. Here we find that he was going into a place where people were not so thrilled about the message that he was bringing, and he was surrounded with fears, and or he had fears within, he had troubles without, and yet that fear protected him from certain times where he could have been destroyed before his time, and, and God uses that fear for self-preservation in us. We're to take care of our bodies. Paul told Timothy to drink a little wine for his often infirmities in 1 Timothy 5.23. So we are to love ourselves and to take care of ourselves in some way. But compare that to Judas, who loved himself more than Christ. He sold out Christ for 30 pieces of silver. Money was more important to him than the Savior. Also. It, it, I, well, I've said this already, but it can't be an abnormal, uh, self-pampering love, an egocentric love, a narcissistic love. And I have met people that are so full of themselves that they, if they, if they do anything that looks like caring for somebody else, it's only because of what they're going to get out of it. And it is not because of their true love for people. God knows that difference in us, and he can help us to know it too. We need to love ourselves the way he wants us to, but we also need to be careful not to love ourselves in such a way that is against God. So you can see love of self can exist inside of a holy heart. And also, when we are sanctified holy and God burns up the chaff of carnality with unquenchable fire, we still have a unique personality. It doesn't change us who we are as far as our disposition as a personality is concerned. Think about Peter. He was outgoing before the day of Pentecost, and he was still outgoing afterwards. God taught him a few things, and he took a, he, he he rearranged the man's motives, but he was still outgoing. Paul, he was a determined and a disciplined man. He said no to John Mark coming along with him on the second missionary journey in Acts 15, 39. It, we're told the contention was so sharp between he and Barnabas as they disagreed as to whether or not they should bring John Mark. So Barnabas took Mark and he went to Cyprus and Paul got the blessing of the Antioch church to go along with Silas in another direction. So we find that we still have a unique personality that doesn't get obliterated when he fills us with the Holy Ghost. Humanity and holiness can exist in the same breast. In case you've just tuned in, you are listening to God's Resistance, where we resist sin, self, the world, and the devil. You can hear us every Sunday at 9 a.m. on WITK, 1550 a.m. and 94.7 FM. You can find us on Facebook and Twitter at God's Resistance. That is G-O-D-S-R-E-S-I-S-T-A-N-C-E. You can also email us at gods.resistance at gmail.com or call us at 570-362-7782. A few more things to speak about when we try and think of holiness and humanity existing together and not being at odds with God. Sometimes we could look at someone else and the appearance to us looks like they have a carnal heart, but their motive or their heart may not be so. 
and, and let me give you a few examples. Impatient. We can be impatient in such a way that's carnal, but we can also have an impatience that is perhaps due to a lack of maturity. We have an impatience to, and a zeal in our heart to want to get God's work done, to get at it and to go now. And maybe God has to help us to realize we need to slow down. He appreciates our love and our zeal, but he's got to teach us what to do. And so sometimes we have that impatience in us to get moving and to do God's work. But if that impatience turns to an anger towards God or towards somebody else, we've crossed the line and gone into a place we shouldn't. Sometimes we're just slow. We, we think we're, we're more cautious. So I've got to wait on God. I got to pray about this more. And maybe God has already helped us to see certain things, but he knows our unique personality. And sometimes he has to help us to get out of that slowness. Sometimes people are just nervous people. Uh, you know, a, a, a noise happens. What was that? Or is everything okay? And they're just high strung in their personality. And so sometimes they speak real quick about certain situations, but it doesn't mean that they have malicious motives in their heart. They're just high strung people. And we can have hangover habits from before and in our old life before, or even in our unsanctified state. We have these, the dregs of that old disease, though the disease itself is gone. The muddy water is gone, but the rit, the rut, excuse me, that the muddy water was in, that's still there. Think about a hangover. I mean, some of you may not know what that is. I happen to know what that was before I was a Christian, but you're not drunk anymore, but the effects of the alcohol are, are still with you. Sheridan Baker, a good holiness man, he said it beautifully in this way. The purified believer will make discoveries of infirmities and defects, which he will be led to throw off and take on new excellencies, which he will discover in the Christ nature as the heritage of faith. He will not be long in discovering rudeness in his manners, which he will deplore and escape, roughness in his speech and tone of voice, which he will deprecate and abandon, and other dregs of the old disease, which will cling to him, though the disease itself has been removed, and from which he will escape by little and little, as beautifully symbolized by the conquest of Canaan. There is a radical distinction between the ugly marks which smallpox leaves on its victim and the disease itself. The person carrying these marks may be the healthiest person in all the neighborhood. So there is a radical difference between the infirmities and crudities which eliminated depravity leaves behind and depravity itself. A person greatly marked by these crudities may be the soundest person spiritually in the church, notwithstanding these great defects and blemishes which injure his reputation but do not hurt his true character. These defects and blemishes, as far as discovered, thrown off, there follows a gradual and sensible increase of light and love and power and at irregular intervals as when at camp meetings or when associated with persons deeply experienced in divine things there will be sudden and remarkable uplifts in the divine life and as each new accession of strength is tried various experiences suited to the mental structure of each believer take place and make up the warp and woof of the life of holiness that sums it up beautifully Sometimes we're used to perhaps speaking quickly without thinking. We're used to talking about ourselves and God starts to help us to realize, and we don't have an, an ill motive where we're so inflated with self, but perhaps just out of habit, we've done this and God starts talking with us about that, you know, and trying to put forth Christ more in front of us. Maybe we had certain tones of voice as he was talking about. Maybe we were unorganized people and undisciplined before. There's nothing necessarily of moral quality there, but God's going to help us. Maybe we used to have a pain fear and God's going to help us to realize that calm walk with him. Maybe we had street life before and it kind of just comes back. I, I dealt with a man who used to uh, be in gang activity and he went out with me to help me find a car. And when we were out finding the car, he's looking over a car with me while somebody else is standing there in the parking lot. And he started acting a certain way and it wasn't, it wasn't necessarily evil or wrong, but he got back in the car and he said, pastor, he said, man, I didn't, I didn't even think about it. He said, I just start talking with that guy. And after I started talking with him, he said, it just start coming out. And my attitudes start changing. He said, I can't do that no more. And that isn't necessarily evil or wrong, but God's going to help us. We've got those deep ruts and God's going to help us to retrain um, ourselves, so to speak. There can be failure or sin after we're sanctified holy. And we need to know that. Peter was afraid to eat with the Gentiles when the Jews came uh, from James. We read that in Gala Galatians 2, 12 through 13. And when he found out that he was wrong, he quickly confessed it and put it under the blood. And so might you and I have to do. 
We can have poor judgment after we're sanctified holy. Paul said to the, uh, it was in a heated situation where people were so angry with him, but Paul says to the high priest, thou whited wall. And then afterwards they said, do you revile the high priest like that? And he said, I'm sorry, I didn't know the guy was the high priest. And he apologized and backed up. We may have a lack of mental ability. We may not be able to think through things and speak so eloquently. We can have limitations of all sorts. We can't do as much as we'd like to. Maybe circumstances or sickness, et cetera, will get in the way. We think about Trophimus, who Paul left sick at Miletum. He no doubt wanted to go with Paul, but he couldn't. Maybe abilities. The Spirit gives gifts several, uh, gives abilities severally as he wills in 1 Corinthians 12, 1, we're told. Sometimes we may have a hard time using those God-given abilities to their fullest. Maybe we don't pray as much as we should or, and, or as much as we'd like. We'd like to pray more and perhaps circumstances hinder us from doing it because of how much we have to work to support for our family or because of physical limitations. We, you know, we, can, we have to have a certain amount of sleep. We try and we try and maybe we just feel like we're not quite where we need to be. Don't get so discouraged. Just keep pressing in and God will help you and pull you through. Maybe we feel like we could have loved better. Uh, We could have shown it better. It's not necessarily that it's an absence of the seed of love, but rather uh, upon reflection, we could have expressed that love in more of a way of fullness of love instead of the way that we did right then. We still need sleep and rest. Jesus told his disciples, come ye apart and rest a while. He told the disciples when they fell asleep in the Garden of Gethsemane, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. They had all the heart in the world to do the right thing, but they got tired. Sometimes we need to realize feelings are not a true judge of spiritual state. You know, our emotions can go up and down, but truth is what we need to base our lives off of. And we're still going to be tempted. Jesus was tempted in all points like as we are yet without sin. We need to have in our minds clear thinking between sin and temptation to sin. We will never get outside of a place where we are not going to be tempted to sin. Let it be said that though we still find we're human after we are sanctified holy, there's no excuse for carnality in our humanness. We need to, God can help us through growth and the power of his spirit to overcome our human difficulties just as well as he helped us to overcome those sins that be in our lives. So sin does not dwell in our human flesh, but sin dwells in our soul. God made human flesh, and he said it was good. Sin entered, and the sin, singular, that disposition of sin, took up resident in our heart. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, the treasure of the indwelling Christ, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. That's from 2 Corinthians 4, 7, as we read in the beginning. So, do not despair, because this is God's plan. We are to be human and holy. There is no problems in the sight of God for us to be human and holy. Do not get humanity wrapped up with sin. People say, oh, I'm just human and use it as an excuse. That couldn't be farther from the truth. Humanity is not at odds with a heart and life of holiness. There's nothing wrong with your humanity. God had calculated our humanity in his plan of redemption. And the indwelling Christ is put in us to light the world with his gospel. It's imperative for us to get baptized in the Holy Ghost, to get our heart cleansed, and to enter into the rest of God. But your earthen vessel is not a bar to his wonderful indwelling. His light, God's holy light, shines the best through the cracks of our humanity because the excellency of the power then is of God and not of us. Please tune in next Sunday at 9 a.m. If you'd like a copy of this broadcast, please look for God's Resistance on your favorite podcasting platform. Look for us on Facebook and Twitter at God's Resistance. That is G-O-D-S-R-E-S-I-S-T-A-N-C-E. Make sure to like and follow us for teaching, preaching, and video content. You can find us on YouTube as well. Be sure to subscribe and turn on the bell to be notified of any new videos. If you need someone to talk to or to pray with, email us at gods.resistance at gmail.com or call us at 570-362-7782. Join the resistance. God's resistance.
A special thank you to Spectacular Sound Productions for giving permission for the use of the song Heroes and Monsters, which was edited and used in part on this production. The permission was granted under Attribution Share Alike 4.0 International Creative Commons license. That license may be found at https colon forward slash forward slash creative commons dot org forward slash licenses forward slash by hyphen essay forward slash 4.0 forward slash legal code.